think of it as the same combination. We come back together as a group and see where we are on these questions. I realize not everybody made it through all of the questions, but we'll see where we are. Okay, so question 10. Uh, question 10, we'll talk about typically we're measuring in the microseconds, right, that, which is kind of interesting, rather than the milliseconds range. Uh, so here's a puzzle about that difference. Our fastest neuronal firing rates are approximately 1,000 hertz. We've mentioned that a few times before. Um, and uh, we've got this one millisecond refractory period. How then can neurons pick up on microsecond ITDs? Somebody help, help us out with that idea. Hyperacuity, right? That's what this is. Okay, thanks. So we, we really talked about the volley theory. Okay. Actually okay, that's one possibility. Can you remind us what the volley theory is? Um, it's where um, hair cells, yes, they have a uh, refractory time, but not all hair cells are in that refractory period, so okay. they kind of switch on and off as roles of receding, okay. and then that information gets integrated to create a, a signal that resembles the frequency of the input sound. Okay, all right, so that, that works for us. So one possible response to that could be something like uh, volleying, right? Okay, I think that works. How many people had a response along those lines? Something like volleying, okay? Do we have some other ideas? It's not entirely clear how this gets resolved, right? I mean, how 
uh, this, this can all happen. Something is still of a puzzle, but the volley theory is, is one, one possibility. There's a related idea, and that brings us to, to question 11, and that's that um, if we think about the previous question of the hyperacuity that we had there, we're also able to discriminate thousands of colors, and yet we, all, we only have something like three cone types, right? So some idea about that. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I think I'm understanding that we can we can discriminate different kinds of colors because we can, for example, not just rely on wavelength differences, but we have hue and saturation, and those have correspondingly physical properties, right? So if we think about saturation, it's how broad that stimulus is in the wavelength spectrum. If we think about brightness, it's how intense it is. That would be a, a vertical shift in, in the description on our graph, okay? Um, but let's just say for kicks that we actually controlled for height uh, on the graph, which is to say we've controlled for intensity. Let's say for kicks that we've controlled for the saturation level, how broad they're distributing. So now we're only dealing with what we might call hue differences positioned along the wavelength axis, okay? Now, we have this axis that goes from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers, and um, we can discriminate lots and lots of colors on there. Uh, what you may or may not know is that we are probably good, many of us are good to about a one nanometer shift, interestingly enough. You can, you can, you'd be pretty good at saying that something that's 590 nanometers is different from something that's 591. You probably couldn't do half a nanometer, but a lot of you could probably do one nanometer. Certainly you could do two or three nanometers. Right? But we only have three cone types. Okay, so if you hold saturation constant, which is a good point that Meg is making, or if you hold brightness constant, right, the intensity, right, brightness would be the perceptual correlate of intensity, if you hold those constants, how is it that we get several, we get several thousand color possibilities psychologically and we only have three cone types? Okay, yeah, thanks. The cone types are just extensive for me, so they can still receive information between all those Okay. Okay. Yeah. So j just to begin to draw that, it is true. Okay, so we can have something like this, and we'll have um, wavelength here, and we can go from 400 to 700. Okay. And I'll draw it very crudely here. We can have something like this, and you might have uh, short wavelength, medium wavelength, and long wavelength cones. And these are the peak sensitivities, right? So the peaks are occurring at very particular spikes. Uh, along here. This might be something like, uh, I'll say intensity is on, is on this. Or I, we'll, we'll, leave it, we'll leave it at sensitivity. Okay? They're sensitive to different wavelengths of light. Okay? So we have those three different peaks. Okay? That, that's certainly true. Of course, we do have the problem of univariance. So if this guy fires, right, all we know is that the short wave cone caught a photon. That's all we know. So if that guy is firing, it could have been that the wavelength came from here or here, right? And yet somehow we have one nanometer, this is lambda in nanometers, we have one nanometer discrimination, right? and yet we have these relatively fat distributions, if you will. Right? So it is a puzzle. Now, I like your, I like your idea that we, there are only the peaks, right? So we're, we're grabbing more than that, but so some other idea about how it is that we have nanometer precision here given that we have this really, really fat distribution of cone sensitivities. How do people at least are understanding the problem? Right? They understand that, okay, you know, how can this come about? Yeah, okay. Um, does it have to do with the rate at which the different cones are firing? The rate at which the different cones, plural, are firing, okay. All right, so let's, let's see if we get something here. I'm gonna arbitrarily pick this part, point on the axis, okay? Now what you're seeing at, at that arbitrarily chosen point is which of these three cone types is firing the most, given where I've drawn that? M, okay, M followed by which one is next? Okay, M, S, and then the long wavelength is cone is firing the most. Are people okay with that? So even though we've got just one particular location here, we're getting a, uh, if you will, sort of like a three-part ratio Right? Or, or the difference, I think, is how you express the difference here. Now, if I move just a little bit this way, I'm going to go a little bit to my right, a little bit longer wave, okay? It's not much of a difference, and it still even might be true that I'm getting M the most, S next, and L the least. 
But what you might notice is as I go this way, I'm going to get a slight uptick in N. Yeah? I'm going to get a slight downtick in the S firing rate, and I'm going to get a slight uptick in the L firing rate. People okay with that? So even a small difference could have a fairly large difference in the combination, the differences across all of them. So there's an interesting lesson there that maybe evolution has picked up on and given to us, and that is that evolution really only needs to code for these relatively broadly tuned regions, right? They, they can have this relatively wide region of wavelength being covered here, and as long as we have two of them, we can always compare their relative firing rates, their differences or their ratios, and that can be highly informative and give us much more precision than we would have had in the width of any one of these mechanisms alone. Who's following that? Anybody not sure? It's a little bit subtle. Yeah, I, see, I think I see one or two confused faces. Are we okay with that? All right, so it's, it's the ratio of firing that can play a, a lot of impression. And so you can imagine that you almost might have these uh, cells that are sort of bumped up here in time, right? They've got their, their peak time on and their peak time off, right? And there can be populations of cells that are interleaved a bit, kind of like this, um, this volleying theory. But their relative response rates might provide a lot of information that would be much more precise than we would have in any one uh, mechanism. So it's one of the ways of thinking about it. I'm not sure it's fully known how we get to this hyperacuity in time. But there's a couple of ways of getting there. We could look at a ratio of responding. We could have interleaved responding. Uh, a couple of possibilities. OK. So uh, we're up to question 12, I think. In your own words, explain the duplex theory of sound localization. Somebody help us out with that. We'll go with Meg this time. Okay, right. So we have we have those two. Some are better at the high end. Uh, some work well for us at the low end. Okay, that's that's working fairly well. I'll call that up just so we can all see uh, what's going on here in the PowerPoint. So we've got this duplex theory. Okay? And it's interesting that we, we have these different kinds of cues that we can use for different kinds of frequencies that are coming our way. Okay? I also think this is really interesting. There's this range that we're really not very sensitive to. Right? We're, we're not getting a lot of information from IIDs or ITDs. Or maybe it could be there, but we're just not particularly sensitive to that. Right? So um, it's interesting that we have a bit of a localization blind spot in frequency space. And we're not localizing as well there as we might otherwise do. And uh, there is an anecdote I wanted to tell about this. So how many of us made it to at least one of the talks last week by Dr. Stephen Mayer? Okay. Was anybody there on the Thursday night talk? It might have been the people got there Friday. Did anybody make it there on the Thursday night talk? Okay. So Liz was there. Do you remember, Liz, that we were about 10 minutes into the talk, maybe 15 minutes into the talk. It was going swimmingly. Everything was well. And then, weirdly, even though Professor Brooks gave a beautiful introduction and asked everybody to turn off their cell phones, all of a sudden we started hearing meep, 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 and it sounded like somebody's cell phone was going, it sounded like a busy signal, okay? Now, what's interesting about that is it was a fairly high-pitched, it wasn't way high, but it was kind of a high-pitched, I'll see if I can, well, let's put in a 2,000, 3,000, and 4,000 hertz tone, just so we get some idea of what we were hearing during Dr. Mayer's talk. It might have been about like that. If it were 2,000 hertz, it would have sounded like this. Probably somewhere in between those two. Is that about right? Yeah. It's a little lower. Oh, a little lower? Okay. Okay, let's try this. About two lower? Is that about right? Yeah, I have as I like, began to be able to tune it out, I was thinking, of, like, oh, I wonder how that works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, so he's speaking. And this thing, it wasn't overwhelmingly loud, but it was distracting, right? Okay, so lots of points of connection. One is, uh, this is all about the exogenous attention that comes and grabs us from the outside, just like in the visual search test. Remember, we talked about that from the MIT test. And we have the different frequencies inside of our brains where if there's something that's bottom-up driven, we're going to have um, a, a, 
level of activation that spreads from the parietal lobe to the frontal lobe. We're trying to hang on to what he's saying. We're trying to do the visual search, almost an auditory search. So now it's going to be a lower frequency that's sent from the frontal lobe back here. So I was thinking about that. Okay? His entire talk was about the controllability of stimuli, and specifically the controllability of aversive stimuli. So here we are trying to listen to this guy, and we have meep, 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 meep going. And so I actually thought that was part of his shtick. Right, I, I thought he was putting us on. I thought these tones were coming from his laptop. Right, he was he was putting us on, and he was going to tell us about you know how many people think that's controllable. Or it turns out that wasn't what was going on. But I, I thought that was part of it. So um, this busy signal that was coming across made a lot of interesting connections. We can connect to exogenous attention. We can connect to the controllability of stimuli. The other interesting thing, it actually we found out later on, was coming from the speaker above. Okay, and that's where it wasn't somebody's phone. It was coming from the speaker above. But we all had trouble localizing it, because even though it was going on for like 30 seconds or more, everybody is spinning left and right. Okay? Dr. Kennedy got up out of her seat and closed the door to that auditorium as if it were coming in from the other side. We couldn't tell where this thing was coming from, which made me think that it might have been in the 2,000 to 4,000 hertz local. But we just couldn't localize this thing. So meanwhile, Dr. Mayer, being the professional that he is, just went on with the talk, and he marched on, and he, he delivered a beautiful talk despite all that distraction that was going on. But uh, it could have been the case that any one of us could have popped up and started playing around with the podium where the sound was actually coming from, but none of us did. And maybe think of the bystander effect. How many people have heard of the bystander effect? Okay, so in that busy signal, we've got exogenous attention, and, and we've got the sound localization issue. We have the controllability of stimuli, relatable to uh, learned helplessness, right? We had the bystander effect. Um, it turns out that was a very busy signal, right? <laughs> There are a lot of things cooking in, in that one example. And uh, we got onto that topic because it was hard to localize, okay? Any questions on that? This is, a, of course, the, the human range over which is, we, we have trouble localizing sounds. For other species, that range is it's going to move. Okay, um, let's see if we can get to question 13. In your own words, can somebody explain why front-back errors are common in sound localization. Even though they're different by 180 degrees, why don't we go with Clara this time, and then we'll go to Liz again. Um, front-back errors are commonly made because the sound coming from directly in front of us and directly behind us hit our ears about the same time. So okay. Uh -huh. I know that when I hear something, I can't decide where it's coming from. I'm just thinking about it, and I do tend to turn. So yeah. It's like you hear it from a different perspective. Right, right. And then that way it's easier to... Sure, right. So the time of arrival cues are going to be identical, even though they're, they're as different as they can be physically, right? And we, we, started, we started this conversation the other day by saying that there's no information directly in the stimulus. We have to somehow pull that information out. And we're able to pull that information out because our, our heads are extended in space. That's going to give us the possibility of an interoral time difference, at least in some cases. And the opportunity for an interoral intensity difference is better if it's front back our brains can't do anything with it. There's really nothing there physically. Yes, please. Why wouldn't the same thing happen if the stimulus was 45 degrees like in front of you, 45, like, wouldn't that happen? Thank you. I, I tried to, I don't know how three-dimensional my videos actually are. I was trying to point to 45 and 135. But when I go back like this on the video, it might not be obvious, right? So um, what we can say is this. If, um, let me see if I can line it up so that you're, actually, I'm, if I were to close my eyes now, this would be just, it, to, this would be due north. That, that way is actually uh, north, that's south. So due north, you're about 45 degrees away, right? Okay, now if I go like this, okay, now you're at 135 degrees away. What's interesting is, in both of those cases, you're on my right side. But what I wouldn't be able to tell very well is whether you're on my right side and 45 degrees this way of due north or 45 degrees that way of due north. But at least I know you're on the north side and not the south side. So I have some localization there. And the same thing is true for anything that's equidistant from a given point, right? We could do plus or minus 10, plus or minus 20. But it's a good question. Who's following all that? Is that working for us? Yeah, okay. Okay, so then let's see if we can line this thing up with metamers, okay? In what way is the issue that Claire has elucidated for us, that front back gives us lots of errors, even though they're physically different? In what way is that metameric? In what way is it maybe not metameric? Okay, thanks, Liz. Um, basically, because a metameric is errors that represent completely different stimuli that we can tell the differences. And so on one hand, someone could think that the stimulus is actually impoverished and they're not actually having a failure to discriminate differences. Okay. Why it 
would not be amenable. Okay, why well, it would not be amenable. Yeah, yeah, really interesting. And so thank you for, for that. And did somebody else have, okay, do you want to add to that? So why it would be amenable. Okay, that's fine. We are failing to discriminate uh -huh. uh, the different stuff. Okay, so that, that on some level makes it a, a minimum, right? Now, when we think about that, though, we've talked about different kinds of stimuli, lots of different kinds of stimuli, and one broad category that we had, we'll see if you remember this, is proximal stimulus versus distal stimulus. Who's a, who remembers hearing about those? Can somebody just remind us what that distinction is, a proximal stimulus versus a distal stimulus? Which is which? Is which? Okay, thanks. Um, a distal stimulus would be something like the desk that's... Um, it's physically far. out there, right? Out there in the environment, okay. It's relatively far away from us, but the proximal stimulus is like the photons coming in and hitting our retina. Yeah, um, right. Yeah, yeah the, the proximal stimulus is on our person. It's on our nervous system, right? Okay, it's, it's proximal to us. It's right on top of us, okay? And the distal stimulus is out here. So if we go back just for a moment and we think about this situation that we had in color vision where we have our wavelengths over here and we get a 590 spike, Okay, that's going to look yellow. And then we get a spike that looks green and a spike that looks red. These two out there in the real world are different from this one. They're physically different. Okay? But what's interesting, too, is these two can land on your retina. And on your retina, they're physically different. Right? When they're coming in, they hit your retina, and you're getting hit with what I would call the green spike and the red spike, whereas over here, you're getting hit by the yellow spike. So on your retina, you're still getting a physical difference that's present on your person. Okay, it's present on your retina. There's a physical difference there. So this is a really good example of a metamer because they're physically different out there in the universe. They're also physically different when they're landing on your retina. Here you're getting two, and here you're getting one. Who's okay with these being physically different? Okay, on the on the person. On, when we're speaking of the proximal stimulus. Okay. Now, given what Claire has just pointed out. We can say that out in the distance, for the auditory case, something is right in front of me or right behind me. Those are very, very different. Okay? But by the time they reach my ear, they're actually the same. There is no information at my ear. There is no interoral time difference. There is no interoral intensity difference. So at that level, at the level of proximal stimulus, there is no physical difference. So maybe they aren't metamers, because metamers are physically different stimuli that are perceptually indistinguishable. Here, they're actually, from the perspective of the proximal stimulus, there is no difference, so maybe they're not metametric. Who's following that? Is that working for us? Yeah, so kind of subtle, but what I like about that is it really forces us to think about, well, what is a metamer? And we say, well, it's different stimuli that are perceptually identical, but we have different categories of stimuli. We have distal stimuli, and we have proximal stimuli, and sometimes that might get us into some trouble. Okay, in the interest of time, why don't we move on to our last question there, and this was a question that was asking us about the pinna, and the important role that it plays in the elevation plane. Okay, um, can somebody help us about out with that? How does that work? How does the pinna help us? Madison has something. Um, so pinna is. <coughs> sorry, the so what does the pinna do for us in uh, in elevation? Right, it's helping us with uh, localizing the elevation plane. Well, it's Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. Okay, somebody want to, that, that's a really good start, actually, to get most of the way there. You want to add anything to that? When the um, sound comes from different angles of elevation, it also makes different, like, I guess it just uh, it bounces differently Okay, right, yeah, so we do have differently shaped, everybody's got a relatively distinct shape to their, their pinna, and probably your left pinna is more or less the same as your right pinna, but they might be a little bit different there, but we're going to call them the same, and the pattern of, of absorptions that we get spectrally uh, are going to be uh, really interesting. We're going to have different kinds of wavelengths coming in, and some wavelengths are going to be absorbed, others are going to bounce, and that will change slightly depending on the angle at which they're approaching you, okay, and that information alone, unbeknownst to you, is actually... Uh, quite helpful in trying to figure out high, how, how high or how low something is in the elevation plane. Okay. Anybody want to describe briefly the studies that are done on that? There's a, the, the PowerPoint presentation ends with some really nice graphs that were, were taken uh, inside of the, the canal, just, just inside of the pinna. Right? They had um, really nice microphone recordings there. What, what point were they making about that? Anybody, thanks. 
as far as I remember, I think that they were talking about how each individual's, like, some people picked up on, like, the higher frequencies okay. and some, like, made sense of lower frequencies. I, okay. Okay. I'm remembering the pictures, and, like, like some were, like, up here. And, like, yeah, let's, let's call up that picture. We'll see if we can get it over here. Okay, so what's going on? Okay, right. Yep. So we have different elevations here. This is a busy, busy graph. They are recording from uh, different individuals, right, and, and, and so forth. And, and you can see that once you change the elevation, you do get slightly different patterns coming in to your eardrum. Right? So there is information there that you can take advantage of. And one other really cool thing is that if you somehow now uh, insert a, a very small speaker inside of somebody's ear and, and you've gotten past their pinna and you play them and you, you play that sound and you have people try to localize, they're really good at localizing recordings that came from their own ears but not recordings that came from somebody else's ears. And so your, your brain has basically learned how to respond to your particular pinna, which makes sense because your brain is very near your pinna. You give them a fairly distinct sounds that are coming from somebody else's ears and, and you don't know how to do, how to do anything with that. They're just, it's a bunch of noise and you have trouble localizing. So we're all, we all get tuned to our own pinna. Go ahead. Um, so there are like, like, vibration recordings that are caused like, when the sound comes in and how it's interpreted in your pinna. Yeah. Like the vibration, specific vibration. Yeah, that's right. So you can even think of them just as sound recordings. So right now, as always, I've got some kind of a microphone on me during, during this presentation. But, and this, this wouldn't fit in my ear but you can have a smaller one, and you can actually just record sound intensities at the two ears, okay. okay, right? And then you play those back, okay, and some of them are recorded from your ears, some of them are recorded from Gabby's ears, and we, we switch on you, and you're really good at localizing your own sounds, and you're really bad at localizing somebody else's sounds, <laughs> which, is, which is kind of interesting, right? So it does show that uh, your brain really has been tuned to your own pinna. Maybe that's not too surprising, but it's, it's cool that you can demonstrate that. How many people are following that? Yeah? Okay, any other questions on localization before we move over to today's, today's questions? Okay, so why don't we go over to today's questions. We had the good opportunity to enjoy, I thought, a, a very inspiring talk by Heather Artinian. And I had only been here for about four months at Denison. And I was watching um, PBS uh, in, in my apartment in the college townhouse, which is the one right next to the Grand Villain. A lot of new faculty live there for their first semesters or first couple of years. And I was watching PBS, and that documentary came ac across called Sound and Fury. And Heather, at that time, in that documentary, she would have been a uh, five, four, five, or six-year-old girl. Right? And she was deaf, no implant at the time. And it was all about the controversy surrounding cochlear implants. I, just, I couldn't believe it. I thought it had to be... Um, I have to get this into the classroom. And now here we are 15 years later, and she's uh, a college student in, in Georgetown. I think it's uh, a, terrific, um, uh, a terrific progression. And uh, the, the controversy, though, still remains. So let's go to our first question, and we'll see if we can have somebody summarize the metaphor that Heather offers about the bridge when she was, on, when she was age five. Somebody went, okay, we'll go with Abby. Thanks, Abby. Um, so she said, like, she's sitting on a bridge, and um, on her right, the left and the right side of her right, and on her left side was uh, her deaf deaf parents, um, and she, like, struggled with the list, and she wanted to be able to talk to the world. Yeah. Okay, right, so she's, she's straddling the two, right? Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's really, really wonderful. I, I used to show it in class. It is a longer documentary, and it took two full class periods, so I don't do it for that reason. But uh, her, uh, two of her grandparents are hearing. Uh, her paternal grandparents are hearing, even though her father is deaf, and her maternal grandparents are not hearing. Um, and um, uh, very interesting. So I, I would imagine the grandparents were on either side of that. Can, can we have some of the criticisms that were coming from each side of the bridge? That's the other, the other part of this um. metaphor. Okay. And then the right side is like, why don't you just give the child the opportunity to Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so lots of controversy that goes on there. Okay, um, in question two, Heather, now as a person who's about your age, right, she, she's approximately your age, she might be uh, one or two years older than several of you, um, she talks about this uh, issue of becoming a Supreme Court justice. Anybody want to try to connect that to 
the deaf president now. That you all wrote about beautifully, by the way. Thank you all for your, your responses last Friday uh, in your essays. Does somebody want to connect those ideas? Why don't we start out with that? I guess the similarity is that um, Ford's kind of wanting to um, be a symbol and like, show people that, like, um, that people are disabled and just differently able and that they're able to do things that very few people do and kind of break that whole distance line. And then I said the difference between the two um, were how Heather kind of emphasizes um, bridges and like um, going out and kind of um, combining the worlds. Okay. Well, um, the, the Deaf President Now movement was more um, about like likeness and like strength in the community. Strength like, within the community, right? Maybe solidifying the community around something, right? Yeah, and there's like breaking out and like um, encouraging people to reach out and like just making people more comfortable um, so that you kind of like break it and like you never know. Okay, okay. Somebody else want to add anything? That was a fairly open-ended question, but nicely, uh, nicely summarized there. Some, some other ideas about, yeah, thanks. I have a general question about how quickly everyone's like working. Can you give like a brief statement? Yes, yes, I can. And um, we will have a quick period. So on, so the day we, I think it's the day we come back from, uh, we're, we're going to have Dr. Tangeman. Uh, how many people have had Dr. Tangeman maybe for a modern languages class? Japanese, was it? Or is it? Okay. I've had him for also the Eastern literature. Eastern well. literature class. He's going to be in. He has a cochlear implant. Uh, Dr. Tangeman is a Denison graduate and has was born with hearing and has, in many ways, typically developing hearing. When he's um, in middle age, he started to run into some hearing trouble. So he has a, a cochlear implant. He's going to come in and talk about his experiences with that. But just as, as an idea, um, we all remember this. What? And by the way, what is this? We all, probably all remember them. What? Is, what is this? Real loud? So the, the, the what is this? The, the, the hair is rubbing together. The hair is running together, right? Okay, so we've got the tectorial membrane, we've got the vascular membrane, right? All of this is going on inside of the cochlea. <laughs> okay, it's so going on inside of the cochlea. So the idea is that we do need the cochlea. Is somebody else hearing that? Yeah. Okay, is that me? It's that uncontrollable beep. We, where do we localize it to? No, that's not that. I'm getting it on that side. Okay, let's do a lo lo localization. Let's look at it. Hold on. Let's look at it and see if we can get a front back error. Right. So if you're looking, if you're looking at that side, and okay, then turn your head by about 90 degrees. I'm I'm getting it more over on this side. Okay. It's, it's not my iPad, is it? I don't know where that thing is coming from. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's not part of my shtick, right? No, yeah, no, that, no that's, that's not, uh, that wasn't part of my shtick. Okay, all right, so anyway, we're, we're, we were on Heather somewhere. What, what, was, what was our last thread on that? I completely lost it. Oh, we're doing this. Yeah, so we were talking about how the cochlear implant works. We're still, we're still responding to Gabby's question. So what we have to do is get uh, something that's going to uh, play the role of the cochlea, right? And so that's going to be basically a frequency detection. Um, you may or may not know that there is a trans there's, there's an internal part and there's an external part. You go in for surgery and you have uh, an artificial cochlea, if you will, implanted, and, and more on that in just a moment. And you can either have it planted on one side or both sides, okay? Uh, even if you have it just on one side, though, there is an external part that you would wear just like anybody else might wear a hearing aid. It's, it's lightly magnetized. It sticks here. And this is going to now receive the, the distal stimulus is coming in. It becomes a proximal stimulus. There is an electronic communication between the external and internal part. And then from there, you've got the internal cochlea that's now artificial stimulating the eighth cranial nerve still. So uh, every, everything thereafter remains the same. You're going to have the eighth cranial nerve stimulation. It's still going to go off to the medial geniculate nucleus and from there off to the auditory cortex. So it was a relatively early portion of the, um, of the sequence, the anatomical sequence, that is being captured by, by the cochlea. Yeah, you actually have to have the surgery, right? Yeah. Uh, and in the movie that we're going to see for Friday, you will see about um, 10 seconds of surgery. And uh, when I did this in the classroom, students had a strong, so a little heads up, you will see some of the surgery. 
There is a 90-minute video on a full surgery, or nearly a full surgery, done at the University of Miami Hospital. Uh, and they just have the camera right there the whole time. It's um, a little bit gory, but uh, anyway, th this, thing, this thing comes in. And uh, so one other thing about them, we have, you know, we can distinguish many, many tones, right? This thing has, um, some of the early ones had only 16 channels, then they got up to 32 channels or, 40, or 64 channels and so forth. And so the more channels you have, the more frequency discrimination you can make. So it's still a little bit on the crude side. One other point about this, as soon as you remove the external bit, you're back to being deaf. Okay? It only works when this thing is, is talking to the internal part and thereby stimulating the intracranial nerve to set up the same chain of events that you would have. Okay, okay. So uh, Heather's got that. Um, I did want to get to the third question. We're doing, I think we're doing okay on time. Yeah, I wanted to get to this question about the Brooklyn accent, okay? So I thought it was hilarious. Did anybody pick up on the fact that she was feigning a Brooklyn accent? And the first time she did it, she was really smooth. I actually rewound it a few times. And then as she repeated it and repeated it, uh, it got more and more Brooklyn-like. Okay, or at least more, more and more in New York. So what was her final response to the question of where are you from? <laughs> Go ahead, Jess. Yeah, okay, right. So yeah, she gave a deliberately flippant answer, right, and, and the person understood it to be flippant. Um, but she is making the point that there's going to be a range of folks who are going to be receptive to this, this difference and other folks who are not. Right? So, really interesting. I, I was just intrigued um, that, that she would pick up on that. Now, of course, partly what she's picking up on is a gesture. And part of it is, you know, people do articulate differently with even their mouth movements and so forth. But I got the sense that she could hear the difference. Right? And what's really cool about that is that the cochlear implants don't give you the same quality of hearing that you and I might have. That is typically hearing people. But it was enough. Apparently, the Brooklyn accent is different enough that it is even discriminable um, using cochlear implants. So that, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Um, uh, I want to open up some questions also for uh, other comments on that video. The Heather World. Yeah, thanks. Just a comment, too, on like how she answered it with like the Africa thing. I thought that that was like a really... Like a really kind way of t like saying like you're an idiot. <laughs> 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 I don't know, like exploiting his ignorance or whoever's asking. Okay. Nice, but then like making it laughable or like making it comfortable. For, for everybody, right? She very graciously made it comfortable for everybody. This is an important lesson in power and justice, whether it's deafness or blindness, or you can imagine any other type of difference right, that, that you might have. Uh, for Heather, she encounters this all the time. For her hypothetical friend from Brooklyn, you know, maybe he had never encountered somebody like that. So he's asking, you know, where are you, where are you from? Where are you from? She probably gets that a lot, okay, and she needs gracious ways of responding to that. You can imagine that people who are in uh, minority groups deal with similar issues all the time. Right? Okay, some other other comments about the video. Yeah, thanks. Just some of the discrimination she sees. She thinks it's from just people being uncomfortable. It's, she doesn't actually feel that like people look down on her. And mm -hmm. Most of the time, like people don't like her because of her ability. But she just thinks that people have a hard time. Like they just don't know how to act, and that's why they tend to avoid. Uh, yeah, right. So one of the last papers that we're going to read about, and it might come up in some of our end of semester presentations, is on that difference. Why is it that people have a awkwardness in interacting with difference? And one possibility that they put forth was the idea of stigma. Maybe they don't like members of that group, right? And they have some hostility. Another possibility is what you might call script ambiguity. It's not that they dislike you or they think less of you. They just don't know how to. They don't know how to respond. Right? So rather than have that awkwardness, they just kind of avoid you. <laughs> but it isn't because they dislike you. It's they don't know what they should be doing. Yeah. Okay, we are at 120. Uh, when we come back on Monday, we'll have the chance to talk about your TED-Ed response to speech perception. I would also like to reserve some, the first portion of Monday to talk about your response to the rest of today's TED-Ed questions where you are generating review questions for, for the exam on Wednesday and for the final exam. Thanks for a great discussion. Hope you have a great weekend, and I look forward to seeing you Monday.